Inspiration, it's everywhere. And if your eyes are open, you can, you can spot it. But it's a little bit like that smell after the burnt match. You know, it dissipates very quickly if you don't jot it down. But that is where the work begins. The work starts at the end of the inspiration. I don't know anybody who became an artist who didn't work on their art constantly. I've been a professional artist for 43 years. That is to say, I've been making my living as an artist for 43 years. But truthfully, I started producing art when I was really little. My brother, Hollis, we were 20 years apart in age, so by the time I came along, he was already studying to be an artist. And when he would work at his drawing board on homework for his classes, or he was also doing technical drawing for aerospace, I would lay on the floor under his drawing board and draw as well. And I was known to steal pens and paper and stuff off of his desk, so he kept me supplied to keep me from doing that. And once I started drawing, it just never stopped. I'm always drawing. At dinner, on the back of placemats or napkins or whatever. instead of math or science or anything else that was being taught at school. I was in the back of the class doing animation. I would do these little animated scenes and I had a buddy who had a movie camera that would shoot single frames and we would shoot those things and make these little reels. Since my brother was an artist and had a lot of artist friends, there were always artists around him and I was always there and so I soaked up a lot of information from a lot of different artists. I didn't think of it as being special at the time but I guess it, it's not something everybody gets to experience. When I finished high school I was taking workshops from artists whose work I aspired to emulate. I learned anatomy from John Zahorek. I learned a lot about printmaking from Skip Whitcomb. I learned about making picture frames from Kang Cho. All these different artists I would study with these guys during workshops. So that is how I became an artist, was being around those people. Well, this is Florida, so every day is a good day to paint. Um, even when it's raining, it's a great day to paint because there's so much personality no matter what the weather is. The Florida swamp makes me feel like home. I come here and it just... Uh, I've never felt at home anywhere else like I do here. If you're gonna stop in a place and paint, check around for baby alligators. That means there's probably a mama alligator, like that one right there. You see it laying across the... It's not like they're gonna bother you. You know, alligators are, they're very passive animal, but they're also very maternal. You don't wanna... I, I try not to set up where there are baby alligators because moms can get very crabby. Composition 
is huge for me, and color is right just below that. When I stepped out here and saw the blue sky against the, the yellow and green, that is just awesome. And uh, this, you know, the blue of the sky reflected in the water, that's gonna be really fun to paint. And then this tree right here, look at the contrast of that. Look how dark that is. And it's this beautiful, simple shape. I'm still kind of scanning everything, but I'm thinking about somehow incorporating that tree and the cattails as they go away are a really nice golden color. So there's this golden stripe running through the landscape. As you reach that farthest distance, the violet of the shadow uh, trees on that, right as they come up and touch the sky. That violet color is just slightly lighter than the darkest darks in this tree in our big water oak here. That's a lot more than you probably wanted to know. I was painting with a group of artists in Jackson Hole and we were arranging to paint the Tetons at six o'clock in the morning right when the sun hits the peak of the mountains. We showed up at five, we set up our stuff. There's just enough light that I can see what I wanna paint. So I've done the drawing and, I, and it's ready to go. We're waiting for the sun. And right when the sun hits the tip, all of us are flying. We're all painting as fast as we can, just letting that sunlight hit the tops of the mountains. And the whole time it's getting sunnier and sunnier the whole time we're painting. And I come to a place where I'm getting ready to paint the trees in the foreground. And another artist named John Zahorik is looking over my shoulder. And he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to finish those trees in the foreground. He goes, no, that painting is done. And I said, no, no I got to finish. I, I have got to finish this part. It's not finished. And he grabs the painting off of my easel and takes off running across the field and he won't give it back. He said, this painting is done and you, you're not allowed to touch it anymore. And I chased him and other artists are laughing at me and, we, and I never did get it back from him until we got back to the place where we were all staying at this ranch. And he gave it back to me there. And he says, always remember that artists are never smart enough to know their own best work. He says, you need to know when to stop. And my brother had that painting for years hanging in his studio. Within a little over a year, just a little bit over a year, I started showing in shows and, and in galleries and professionally sort of took off. I did my own work, I worked on work for Hollis, and, I, and that was sort of our life for the next 15 years. My wife and I both have sort of a mantra about always being up for the adventure. Whenever the adventure arises, we always say yes. Paula's done it several times and I've done it several times. We've dragged each other by the hair back and forth in our careers. I can't think of any of it I've ever regretted. It's all been pretty cool. It's all come out uh, on the positive for us. The opportunity to go to Disney popped up in 93. They had opened an animation studio at the parks in Florida. Where our studio was in the building, there was a walkway up above five feet or so off the ground and there was a, a wall of glass and the tourists could come through and look down and watch you make a movie. We called it the fishbowl. I learned to do some really miraculous things by working on those films. These clouds are changing fast, but such is the nature of painting outdoors. We're gonna pull in some ultramarine. I'm gonna rinse the brush. I'm gonna go for cad orange. Look at how that orange destroys that blue. 
tint the edge of the gray with this violet. This is a dioxazine purple. This is the color that Hollis hated more than any other color on my palette. He always made fun of me for using this color. But Lynn Schmiel taught me to use this. It's too intense by itself, but man, when you pull it into a gray, it makes the best gray violet. You all from here? From Missouri. You know where Lake George is? I know where Lake George is. Yeah, we take the boat up there. I love Florida so much. Man. This is such a fun place to live. I'm ninth generation. Daughter right over there. My kids, they ten generations. That's great. That's a big vulture feather. If you're going to be painting in the field anywhere, you're going to have to learn how to talk to people while you work. Because they are they're coming. I had a big discussion on this subject with my students in England. We're painting at a garden, a very public, formal garden, and there's 30 students, and these guys won't start painting because people keep walking by. And I start lecturing on the idea that you're going to need to learn how to continue to work and talk to people a little bit. I know that you're worried about whether or not your work is good enough to be seen, but the, the fact of the matter is you're going to have to learn to do this. And I gave them some pat answers and, and we were talking. And uh, a bus pulled up. There are close to a hundred little Chinese kids, ages from about nine to maybe 12, start piling off of this bus and barreling towards us. They're all headed our way. And there are a couple of interpreters trying to stop them from infiltrating this class, but they're so excited. They're getting between people and they're painting. They're, they've got no sense of personal space. Speaking Chinese back and forth and, and my students are panicked. And I've got a painting going here and I've got about six kids around me. This young, boy standing next to me is really watching. He's really watching me paint. And I loaded the brush and I handed it to him and I indicated where I wanted him to paint. He kind of froze up and I was telling him, it's okay, and I'm taking his hand, go ahead and paint. And he got in there and he was painting so carefully between the clouds and all the other kids are going, <sighs> you know, he, he was letting him paint on his painting. And I'm telling the students, don't take your art so seriously, you know, don't be so panicky about your art that you can't share it, you know, even tactily. It's just a painting. It's not going to kill anyone if he ruins it. It's not a big deal. And when he handed the brush back to me, I washed it out and I was going to reload and, and keep painting and he's talking to the interpreter and the interpreter comes to me and said, he wants to buy that painting. And I said, oh, I'll just give him the painting. But no, he wouldn't take the painting. He needed to buy the painting. He pulled out a, a 20 pound note and I had a five pound note we traded and he took the painting. And he was so happy. He had this super tactile interaction with art that he hadn't planned on that day. And the other kids saw it happen. Then the interpreters running around saying, who else wants to sell their painting? These kids want to buy your paintings. It had this huge impact on all of them and the students. I can't think of a time where doing something like that hasn't been a positive thing. My intention is to just keep passing it on. The whole time I worked with my brother, he was very involved in young people's art. I've seen him cancel an entire day and sit down with somebody and go over their art and talk to them about it. He'd critique their work and be super honest and real 
helpful, you know, uh, very encouraging. And I've sort of adopted that into my way of teaching students. I try to convey all of those traditional skills that all of those artists for all of those years have been pounding into me. The skill of drawing is dying. Color theory is another big one. And being able to see and simplify is a huge one. If you understand all of those old skills and can utilize them, then you can apply that to your digital work if you want, or any medium you want to, because all of those rules apply. The medium is incidental. I feel like I'm kind of obligated to pass that stuff on. I just, I think it's really important. It was important to Hollis, and maybe that's why it's important to me. I'm not really sure. I just know I can't stop.